understanding for the, this, uh, some of the oil and gas projects going on in Texas, but uh, I put a couple of slides in here just to kind of give you an idea. Um, all right, so make sure I get the, there you go. This is a map that I, I make for uh, this point, I think, I think there's one sitting here in case you want to look at it closer, but it shows that, I, and it, it shows all of Texas, and, you know, Austin is sitting right here, and San Antonio, Houston, Corpus Christi. And the play that we've been focused on has been this, this one they call the Eagleford Trend, which is, which is just another name for a rock formation. And, uh, but it's, it's very productive for oil and gas. And it, the trend started a few years ago into the, with the horizontal drilling. And, and in the process, these are only uh, eagle fruit or equivalent wells. And uh, if you look at central Texas along this boundary, that's the outcrop. So if you want to see the eagle fruit and actually go up and touch it, you can do that right close to Austin. So it's actually on the surface. Most of what you guys see around here is the Austin chalk. And it's named for Austin, Texas. That's the first place it was seen on the surface. And that's what a lot of the stonework around here is the Austin chalk. Also uh, productive for oil and gas and in the same trend. So this, this map just shows all the wells. And the, and the green ones are oil, and the red ones are gas. Yes, it so it gives you an idea. Of, of, it looks like the map's been entirely drilled up. And it's not, and we'll show you detail. But, but this trend, this has all happened since 2008. All these wells. Predominantly, all of these wells here have been drilled since 2008. Okay, so it's producing over a million barrels of oil. I'll show you. And, and this is uh, this is that slide. This is a new slide that government uh, uh, a couple of years ago put up a spy satellite um, to take a night view of mostly of, of troop movements and things. But you can see. The trend of drilling rigs, trucks, and such that exist from a night view of space. So, when you think about this kind of play, and you see the, you see the towns, so that just points out you know you can see the effect of Houston, San Antonio, Austin, and of course Dallas, and all of those all that activity that sits down here is all a result of of drilling it. Now. People say that's all flares, gas flares. It's not. I, I caution people. I, we had a uh, deal with uh, uh, Scott Tinker from uh, uh, Tinker, Scott Tinker from the uh, Bureau of Economic Geology right up here at the Road University of Austin. <clears throat> and he said, "Well, that was because we were flaring gas. Yeah, we flared a lot of gas, but that's not only flaring. This satellite uh, is designed for uh, troop movements and." Uh, the last time I saw uh, a, a, a bunch of tanks moving across the border, nobody was flaring gas. This picks up uh, residual heat, okay? And there's a lot of things to generate heat out there. But it does show the impact. This is a pretty much was a dead area. I mean, you think about this trend in Texas was is basically unpopulated, and, and and that so it gives you an idea. That's the eagle for trend there. So if we go to the United States, which is pretty interesting. And you can see the eastern seaboard. There's the Eagleford. There's the Bakken that you guys hear a lot about. The Bakken up in North Dakota is producing almost a million barrels. He actually, Eagleford produces more oil now than the Bakken does. The Bakken's been going a little bit longer. And you can see in the center of North Dakota that um, there's a lot of activity there. And also, actually, if you guys have been out to middle of Odessa, the whole Permian also is, uh, has got uh, several hundred drilling rigs working too. So it's. Uh, you can probably see the Marcellus trend, but it's buried up there in all the cultural light that you see from uh, the eastern U.S. And of course, the only other city you can take out of this, that's Denver, Colorado Springs, Salt Lake City, and then of course, Los Angeles, San Diego. So you can see the cultural impact. And this satellite's kind of fun. I actually downloaded the data from uh, the NSA and NOAA to see if I could replicate this slide and kind of find out you have to do a tremendous amount of filtering to make this work. So it's good for display, but it's uh, it's not all it makes it to be. But look at the eagle for trend. So here's Texas, here's the outcrop. There's uh, the town of Eagleford, Texas is uh, 
is actually between Dallas and Fort Worth. That's where we first saw the shale on the surface. But if you look at this play, the same rocks actually on the surface all the way through the eastern United States. And this, this, this trend that we're looking at here when we're saying, hey, it exists right here, this trend would go all the way over across the United States. A big, big oil and gas trend. It's going to make this, this trend. <clears throat> There's the names for all of it. They change its name as it goes across. But this uh, oil and gas trend would go all the way up into the eastern United States. I actually went up into Maine, and I found those same rocks that we're drilling here in Euford. In Maine, you have the same ones in Georgia, same ones in Florida. Over here, we call it the Tuscaloosa Marine Shale, but it's oil and gas production. So you kind of think about how much resources is available in the United States, and you know if you run into the minerals. Is that Tuscaloosa quite a bit deeper? Okay. Well, it has to be. The Tuscaloosa actually turns out for a lot of the Euphrates is not deeper. It's, it's in the 12 to 14,000 foot range. Some of the Euphrates is shallow, 7,500 feet, but a lot of the Euphrates we're drilling now is 14,000 feet. People just think they always want to hear it's shallower. Yeah. But um, I just just finished a well uh, in, <clears throat> in the right on the Whitley Lockett County line, and the the total measured depth was 20, a little over 20,000 feet, but we didn't start to turn until 13,000 feet. So no, it's very very similar in depth. And everybody says it looks deeper than the Euphrates. Yeah, it's deeper than a lot of the Euphrates, but it's not as deep as over what a lot of what's going on now. Typically. When you're shallow in an oil play, you know, it's heavier oil. As you go deeper and you, and you bury the rock a little bit deeper, it gets, it gets hotter. And in, in the old, uh, or, you know, the earth's refinery starts cracking those uh, heavy molecules down into lighter molecules, and eventually into gas. So you go from oil and you gradate right into a volatile oil, into a gas condensate, into a gas play. When you're in the Eagle Bird, what makes it really exciting is if the price of natural gas is suppressed, then all of, all the drilling rigs just move north and drill in the volatile oil gas condensate window, or they go all the way into the oil window. If the gas price comes back, the rigs move back into the gas window. So it gives us an idea when we're actually out looking for the minerals to buy. We always look at the price of the commodity and say, you know, where where is you know where is it best to own? It'd be nice to own it all, but right now everybody's focused on light oil and gas condensate. You buy minerals in the gas window, but they probably wouldn't get drilled until the price of gas gets above five and stays above five. And then we would go back as a mineral buying company and buy in the gas window. There's a lot of opportunities out there. This play has that. Now, let's, uh, and if you put some geology on it, you can, it starts to look kind of fun, and, and there's a lot of information going on. You can see the uh, Appalachian Mountain trend. You can see the watch, I'm sorry, the watch top trend through here. And a lot of those rocks are right out here, which is nice about Austin, Texas, right here in Austin, Texas. Tuscaloosa, Woodbine, uh, Raritan, it's all got different names. You're going to hear those names over the next 20, 25, 30 years as people talk about this place. It is an expense. Of course, nobody's going to be drilling in Chesapeake Bay anytime soon, so if you guys have that property, but. Um, well, I have a question, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, when an exploration company drills, mm -hmm. they strike a little. It's a certain amount of barrels per day. You know, we have a decline curve. Mm -hmm. When, what is the determinant for them to do some pad drilling where they say, okay, this well is producing X barrels. Yes, we'll, we'll put down four more wells within, you know, the parcel. Where, where is that break even or the, the, um, for an exploration company? Is that 300 barrels or 500? Well, it's, it, it's really, we know what the, let's say the average of these wells is going to be once it's been established. And we know, so we know what the, so we take all the wells in Eagle for Trend and we, we, we do an analysis of them. And the average, let's say the, uh, the, uh, the mean, uh, so the top of the bell curve. So we know we'll drill some really good ones and we'll drill some poor ones. But statistically, we'll drill a bunch of good ones. We know what that is. We zero in on that mean. If that mean is economic, let's say 350,000 barrels, that tells you that if you drill enough wells, you're going to get there. Now, 
which means you should just go drill all your wells and have your own. Unfortunately, the way that our, our, our land leasehold works is I get to, as set by the Railroad Commission in Texas, I, uh, I get to unitize. And, I, and they set the regulations or say here in Austin, and they say you can drill um, so many, such a spacing, right? And they give you a large spacing to start with, so let's say 640 acres. So I drill one well, I get to hold under production 640 acres, which means I will eventually develop that. Mm -hmm. But I don't necessarily need to do it now because I have a whole bunch of those tracks yet to drill. So the first phase of these plays is really starts off as determination of the statistics, making sure it's economic. Once that's done either by individual companies or by the industry, then we know what the economics are. So we know what we have to drill for to make that economic. Then it comes down to the land grab, and then it comes down to holding that land, and then to full patent development. And nobody jumps into full patent development until they've already held all their acreage. Then they come back and do it fill your own. It would be nice to do it properly with to do it all, drill all your wells at one time. But you just can't because you don't have enough rigs. There's just not that much uh, iron out there to drill all the wells from pads. So you drill one well, hold a big bunch, come back in with a development plan and centralize your facilities, and then drill your pads. You can't go back to a little pad and put another rig on it because you, once you start producing oil, and it's got too much infrastructure. So the first well is a single pad, and then from there on, there are six, eight, ten wells per pad. I haven't seen too many of the Eagle Free that get more than about eight wells per pad. But we have a lot of them now that are two and three and four. And the rigs now have walking packages, so the whole rig has feet and it can move itself over, and you just keep drilling. But it's not the first thing. Walking back. Yeah. What makes it economic? Like how, many, how much oil is this has to be coming out of the ground in the initial phase for exploration companies to say, yeah, we want to put four more? You know, right now, if you. Uh, and it's really is, it's kind of interesting, is that commodity price, um, so you take the, the, your estimated total barrels and your commodity price tells you how much your revenue is going to be, you discount that over the life of the well. Then you subtract off what it costs you to drill it. If your drilling cost exceeds a, a, a decent return, then you, you don't do it. In this case, the drilling costs continue to come down because the rig technology and drilling technology is going up. So used to we could drill a well, let's say we could drill a, a vertical, I could drill a vertical well today to 13,000 feet, so a little, over, uh, a little over two miles. I can do it in five and a half days. 20 years ago, that would take me 90 days. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the 20,000 the 20, foot one we drilled with Sabine, uh, from the day we moved the rig until we moved the rig off was 24 days to 20,000 feet. I used to drill wells in West Texas to 20,000 feet in Gomez Field, and they would take all year. So you can see that the, the drilling technology has come way, way down. Of course, What's the it takes, difference in cost? Then? Well, it's, uh, you think about that rig runs you anywhere from $17,000 uh, 17, a day up as high as $25,000 a day for the rig. Then you got to put fuel and stuff on top of it. So you, you, know, you just you can do the math. I mean, it's ridiculous what the price is coming down. You know, uh, we, the, the, Fastest we drilled the well in Eagleford, we drilled 4,700 feet, so just shy of one mile in one day. It's, and that's a record, actually, but there's a lot of people out there that are duplicating that. It, it's, uh, and it's all technology. It's uh, the steering, it's the, uh, the these top drive rigs, it's the experienced crew. A lot, of, a lot of these rigs are no longer, they're becoming more and more mechanized. So there's less and less people in their action. So you start, you start making the rig a lot, uh, you know, where you don't put people in dangerous positions like, you know, making a pipe and stuff like that, it's always dangerous. You do that with the mechanical things and so it goes faster. It takes a human error out of it. Do, do you um, see any, many situations like in the deep ocean where they were drilling 18 to 20,000 feet for, for gas? It wasn't all that productive because of tight sands. If they go back in and rework it and then we produce oil out of the same well bore. Yeah, and it's interesting because uh, hydrocarbons are, are kind of, see, let's back talk about hydrocarbons a little bit. The, uh, all of these hydrocarbons are, are the basis is an organic material. So you, you think about it, uh, we always think about dead dinosaurs, right? Dead dinosaurs died and fell in the water, and, and that's what makes you gas. And it's, it's a nice story, but most of the uh, most of the oil and gas that comes off of the, uh, uh, the planet um, 
is from uh, algae and uh, uh, different planktons and things like that. So it's not really dead dinosaurs as much as it is just algae and you know, certain other things. But uh, can be tree bark and leaves and anything organic that you see out here. That organic material is, is, laid, is laid down as the rock is being deposited. So these were big inland seaways, and you had big, big basically stale, nasty lakes. Um, this is all Cretaceous age, so you know you could come 150 million years ago. You had Texas was covered in water, and you had a lot of foliage and a quite a bit of volcanics. It turns out in Texas, so you had a very warm planet, a lot of CO2, global warming basically. So Cretaceous age global warming. And as the plants and stuff die over the, the next 20 or 30 million years, about, about every inch of rock is, is about a half a million years. So it it's all gets deposited. And then it gets covered with whatever else. In this case here, it's covered with the Austin chalk. So <coughs> sunlight, the, the water wasn't very deep. You had a lot of sunlight. You had a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, more like weak coral reefs and stuff that would grow. And, create the carbonate, so the carbonate's a byproduct of a lot of little critters. And you bury it a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper, and eventually it gets hot. And when it gets hot, it starts to cook that organic food. And it cooks it, and the first thing to come off of that, you know, is oil. That's the first phase of, of refining. And then eventually to gas. But these rocks are so tight that the gas can leak out a little bit. But the oil, the molecules are you know five times as big, and they can't get out of that, that material, that tight rock. When you come into one of these plays and you, and you go and say, I'm going to go to a Bossier well, and I perforate this, these sections that are very porous, or even though they really considered to be tight, the first thing it produces is the gas. You'd think it'd be the oil, but it's not. It's the gas, because the gas can move easy. And the oil, it, it, you've got to open it up a little bit more to get all the little highways open to get the oil out. And what we found is in these plays, so this is a this is a shale section here in black, and these are carbonates, and these are sands up here, and that's the Austin chalk up there. And if I come in here and I perforate this this section, or more importantly, if I get to this section right here, I want to get gas out of this one. If I open up these shales, I get the oil out of the one. So you come back in on different phases. And, and, and it's, it's not really, it's counterintuitive to the industry because the industry always goes for these maybe high porous sandstones that are, are very productive, but you don't get the commodity you want because it's still locked up in this rock here. And that's what's made this whole play is un unlocking what's stored in there. It's so still how are they unlocking that now with this technology? It's but is called that injecting some kind of sand or some kind of chemical? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I'm not a conservationist yeah. conservation or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's fine, <laughs> too. So, so, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, look, I'm, a, I'm, I'm as much a conservationist as the next guy, right? I, I mean, I think that you know, we, we need to protect the planet, obviously. We, can, we have to live here. I'm not from another planet. I mean, I came here, I lived here, right? So I want to hold it so that I can come here my kids and grandkids. Um, we do frack. We, we, we actually pump sand in there. Okay, I just uh, These rocks have a lot of storage. They have what we call porosity. They don't have any permeability, which are the highways that connect them. So we have to create those highways. And we do that through hydraulic fracking. Frac okay? So uh, I'll digress a little bit here, but uh, <coughs> let me just show you something here. Just, uh, if, you, if you're interested, I mean, fracking is, is quite quite novel and a lot of people are like, oh my God, they're gonna stop this and it's gonna it's gonna be a problem and and you say, you know it I gave this talk to the industry uh, last week. Let's just uh, jump through a few of these. These don't worry about the slides. Because the, the this is all about the history of the oil and gas industry and about scale. But let's go look at fracking. I uh, put some slides in here. Uh, I thought about putting them in there from these guys. There's the first eagle for the well, by the way. For what? Let me just show you this. Because I'm, I'm, if I have a question like what you're asking, I, I, uh, I go try to figure out a way to rationalize it myself. And you know, I'm going to come down here to a slide. You're going to see a few of these again here in a minute. 
Okay, so there we go. You guys recognize the Washington Monument, right? Okay, so it's it's 555 five and a half, 555 inches tall. Okay, it's 55 feet, yeah. one and a half inches on a side of the bottom. If you go to it, you look at it and go, that's darn impressive, right? Now it's got scaffolding on it, it doesn't look as impressive because there was an you know, earthquake that had in the eastern U.S. So it, it weighs a, a little over 181 million pounds if you took the whole stones and decided to use it for something. Okay, so let's just rationalize, if you will, um, how much gold did we mine in the United States? Do we have any idea? Three Olympic size swimming pools. Oh, no, no, in the world. In, well, in the world. The world uh, produces about, about 50 million troy ounces a year. Okay. How much is it? How much is it? If I take, can I, how many of these Washington monuments can I build if I took all the gold that's ever been mined over the last 200 years? We've been mining gold since the Aztecs, but they didn't mine 50 million ounces a year. That's what we mine today. If I took all, by the way, 50 million ounces is what we mine in the world in any one year. And if you take the price of gold today, that's only about um, $11 billion in, in gold a year. And, and that satellite that I showed you, that satellite that was put up, cost the government, well, GPS satellites cost the government $13 billion to put up now. You think about, well, we, you know, there's a lot of disconnected gold, but 50 million Troy ounces times 200 years. Is that a reasonable number? Mm -hmm. If I take that, mm -hmm. all the gold not met <coughs> by man, that's every bit of it, every scrap of it on the planet, <coughs> it's less than less than half of the Washington Monument. And I did all the math. So what I'm saying is we should be gold mining on the side. We <laughs> should. <laughs> it's just not that much of it. Yeah. All right, so now I take the biggest, and I did the math. I, 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 you know, I worked it out because I have a degree in, uh, in uh, geophysics and a, and a minor in geology and physics and math. I actually figured out the, the whole Washington Monument, and I did the math. Someone told me it was a third, and it's not. It's actually closer to 50%, but, but it, it, you know, if you do the, the whole comparison, you say, man, that's just, I almost feel guilty having a gold ring, because there's just not much gold out there. That's why it's a precious metal. So how much, if I do the same calculation for the biggest eagle for the well, this is the biggest one drilled today. So this is your 10%. This is uh, drilled by EOG. EOG drilled this, this well, the Burroughs well, and, Gonzales County, I'll point out on a map in a bit. This well uh, came on for 7,500, a little over 7,500 barrels of oil per day, and uh, almost uh, 7 million cubic feet of gas a day. So the equivalent of that is about 8,600 barrel equivalent per day. They fracked this well, you're talking about, they fracked it, so they pumped sand down. So you, what you do is you go into that lateral and you, you shoot holes in it. You basically cut holes in the pipe. And then you, you separate it as you do it, and you pump water and sand in there. And that sand goes out, water goes out, and it, it, it creates these highways. Then the oil can flow into it. So they put in 15 million pounds. Now, the thing about that is that is one of the largest stimulation jobs. We call it permeability enhancement, not fracking. Because fracking has all the bad words that go with it. Permeability enhancement. So the profit was 15 million pounds of sand. So then, how much is 15 million pounds of sand? Now, I don't know how much it is. I was like, when I go out to location, is it the size of this room? By the way, the gold for one year is about the size of the living room, so it's not going to be right about swimming pool. Uh, you know, I see trucks of this stuff coming in. How much is that? How much sand is it? Well, it's only, if you take it, it, it and you look at it, you know, it's this much of the, it's not that much in comparison to that, in comparison to that. 15 million pounds of sand is nothing. It's not that much sand. Right? If I ground the Washington Monument up, I can frack 11 wells. That doesn't sound like much fun, does it? 
that would be politically accurate. Would be happy about it. And they would be happy. So it still doesn't, it doesn't give you an idea for size. So what I did then is I said, all right, let's do this. Let's uh, take the same thing and let's lay the Washington Monument out on the ground. So I just laid it over on its side. So that's 550 feet, right? So then I drill my well. This is that well. That well is 5,340 feet from the curve to the toe. So it's almost a mile long. Under, underground. <laughs> so how many Washington monuments? Not quite 10. 9.6 Washington monuments. Right? Now I take that same little bit of sand. By the way, that's not to scale because Remember, that's 55 feet, so that's not a scale. <clears throat> that little bit of sand, and I spread it down that well. So now you do the math and say, how much area is that? If I took a, drill, if, if it took a backhoe and I, I dug a trench a mile long, and then I laid a five, piece of five and a half inch pipe in it, how big a trench would that be to fill it if I filled it with 13 or 15 million pounds of sand, right? And if you did that, you'd have a hole that's about four foot deep. It's not very much sand. Now, of course, that's not the way it works, because the way it works is, you know, you're going to frack it, you're going to create these highways, and you're going to put that sand in there. But 15 million pounds of sand in a 5,000 foot lateral is nothing compared to the length of that lateral. <coughs> this whole talk was about scale. People don't understand how big Alaska is because you see at the bottom of your map for 12 years of your school and you realize it's twice as big as Texas. You don't understand how big the Eagle for Trinity is. We don't see how much sand it takes to, to frack them well. Maybe we should frack these wells with twice that. It's not a lot of sand. It's, 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 but it seems like a lot because someone says anything over you know, a million, a million dollars which used to be a lot now, I'm not sure it is either. But you see that is not a lot. You put that in there, you just push it out. When you push it out, it allows the oil to come in. Now what this technology's done is it's allowed us to drill more wells closer together. When we were drilling gas wells, we tried to use less sand but create a bigger window. So we didn't want this sand to be just a few feet around the well, but we wanted it to be a few hundred feet. Is that a railroad commission thing? They... No, it's an industry thing. Okay. But industry is, you know, we're learning as we go. So we're still testing and testing and testing, and, and the wells in the Eagle get better and better and better. And the same thing with like the Bakken. That's why the Eagle Free, the first well drilled the Eagle Free was in 1953 and produced oil. It didn't produce like it does today until, really, until, like, until this year. I mean, it takes, Sometimes decades to learn a technology to get the oil out. Good news is we're always trying new technology. And the price, commodity price helps to do that. And of course, it's harder to import oil now. There's less oil in the world. You try to you know, you, you just work on developing. This kind of stimulation, all that, that sand can't go very far. So you create that network right around the well bore, and it doesn't go very far. It only gets the oil out of now, mind you, fracking is not the, the end-all, save-all, because even doing this, we're only going to get like 30% of the oil out of the rock. There's still another 70% stored there that we'll have to figure out how to get out later on. So what you do is you'll drill well bores closer together, you'll stack them up and down, you'll, you'll bring your density down. So first density was, say, 160 acres. They said to everybody, said, well, if I do this, I can get them to 80 acres, and I can get my recovery up. And now we're looking at people testing 20 acres. So they put a well bore every 20 acres. And then pad drilling becomes a necessity just because of logistics. You don't have that much land to go out and, and, and drill. Now, in this presentation, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't show the comparison, but if I showed energy equivalent of a windmill, Oh, an oil well that produces one and a half barrels of oil per day. One and a half barrels of oil per day is the same amount of energy as a windmill. 
in a well that produces 7,500 barrels. Think about how many windmills that would be. They're not very efficient. They're not very efficient. <laughs> Oil is by far the best uh, energy storage of energy that we've ever had on this planet. Well, maybe uranium, but anyway. So that's kind of digresses, but it shows you that hey, this is what we're doing. We're drilling this well. We're fracking it. We're opening up that couple hundred feet around the well bore, allowing all that oil to come in. Wells like this one, they're, are, they're not going to be incrementally, you can't take, say if I have a well that's 500 barrels a day, that well may produce 400,000 barrels, right? But a well that starts at 7,500 barrels a day is not going to be five times bigger. It might be twice as big because you're going to get all that oil up front and then it's going to decline over a long period of time. So you do get incremental. So when you look at IPs and you say 7,500 barrels a day, this well's going to be 2 million, 3 million barrels. It's probably not. It's probably going to be two and a half times more than a well that come on with a little bit lower rate. But I've had wells come on, I've held them at 350 barrels and I've produced 100,000 barrels in 12 months. Extremely economic. Right, so there's there's a lot of other nuances that go on in these things, and you like to see high IP rates, and you'd like to have the production. This well will pay for itself, which is the other thing. It pays back all its drilling and completion costs in the first uh, 180 days. So now, from that point forward, after three months, this thing's you know it's just profit. After six months, you're pure, pure, pure profit. But your discounted money says that this thing will be about <clears throat> maybe three, four, and one. Not bad. I think EOG made a press release. They did that well, the particular well you're talking about, and paid out 60 days. Yeah. Pretty under cost. <clears throat> yeah. And that's the other thing about these plays. I mean, it takes a lot of capital to get them going. I mean, so let, let's go back to my other presentation here. So that kind of shows you a little bit about scale of fracking. Um, I have hundreds of presentations, by the way. <laughs> Okay, so let's look at the geology. So this is Mexico here, and these are just, these are well bores that have been drilled through the Eagle Fruit over the, the last couple of decades. So from Mexico all the way through Texas and all the way over into Mississippi. And that's the rock that we're interested in, really, is that part of this rock, the dark black. See here, it's real thin. It's an area we wouldn't be drilling, we wouldn't be buying minerals. And then if you come over this, the San Marcos Arch and you open up, now you've got a thousand foot of rock. Uh, we'll go back to talking about that well bore fracking only a couple hundred feet of <coughs> well bore. And if the rock formation is a thousand foot thick, how many well bores would you have to drill to get all the oil out? A lot. <clears throat> Which means you drill your first wells, hold your acreage, pad drill the next level, and then come back out of those well bores, drill some more laterals and frack them and complete them. And you keep doing this over and over again forever. As long as we use oil in our system for energy, so you're, you're using the same well bores. You could, you could, or you could just come in and just drill several different ones. Technology doesn't allow you to stimulate or frack more than one lateral out of any one vertical well. We haven't developed that technology yet. Mm -hmm. okay. When we develop that technology, I'll drill one, drill it out. And then I'll drill another one and another one and another one and another one if I can stimulate them to get the oil out. Mm -hmm. It's not there yet. Mm -hmm. That's yet to come. Yes, well. So, I mean, there's just tons of things going on. Uh, the technology, the industry went through a period of almost no research and development, no innovation, no change. And then in the last five or six years, we've seen what companies bring back. I mean, Gerald can and relate and talk to you about companies that had huge research and development budgets back in the, in the 70s, mm -hmm. 50s, and the 60s, and the 70s. And every, every 10 or 20 years, the industry would drop, and all that people would be let go, all the smart scientists. Now they're back in the industry, and they're coming up with technology. The technology we're seeing here is really is going to be based on stimulation. I want to put more sand away, less water, because the other thing about fracking is <coughs> surface water. You don't want to suck out Lake Austin here and use it for frack water. Don't want to do it. But if I go find water that's not drinkable, non-potable water, there's an unlimited supply of non-potable water. There's an even more, larger supply of salt water. 
So you know, nobody would care if I was using ocean water to frack a well. And I don't really go get it out of the ocean. I actually get it out of formations in the ground that contain water. And how's that going to affect the equipment if you use this? Well, it's going to be more corrosive, but then it means we just build equipment that, you know, is made out of, out of yeah. something that's less corrosive. I mean, we, we just innovate. We, uh, or more importantly, it means that it would, I, would, I would have to flush that equipment out and clean it more often than they really want to do it, which means the price would change. <clears throat> but um, yeah, um, the only thing about using non potable water is not a problem because it's just great water or just non drinkable so that we can get it out of the shallow layers. The uh, salt water, the problem is I don't want to spill it because it would kill plants. So I have to be careful there. So you're always kind of trading off. Well, it's a little more this, it's not dangerous, but you know, uh, it's a little more of this and a little less of that, and you can play around with it. But, but uh, the way the industry is going, we're, we're innovating into several things, one of which is going to be not using water at all. You know, maybe we use oil, which has been done. I used to frack wells with, uh, with leach crew, condensate. But it's dangerous because now you've got a volatile uh, subject. In this case, we would stabilize it with, uh, with uh, phosphate, which was made into napalm, basically as napalm, which you guys are familiar with the Vietnam era, once you know what napalm was, a defoliant. It's actually a, a gelled gasoline that they spray and light on fire. And uh, we would we pump that. But then you're pumping a volatile subject into the ground, which can be dangerous if it's 120 degrees outside. So, you know, everything has a trade off. And you're always thinking about safety first, the environment and safety related to each other. And then how do we get these out economically? So we're planning. The industry doesn't live in a vacuum. Uh, non potable water, or more importantly, reuse the water. So that, that well that EOG was producing actually made 1,800 barrels of water a 